And that's what I have found out, is that people that are always trying to achieve uh, higher levels of consciousness and spirituality through their intellect, usually end up becoming very pompous and proud. And the more pompous and proud you become, the less you can hear the voice of God, if you can hear the voice of God at all. And Jesus is trying to bring his disciples and all those that he came into contact with into a place where they can understand that this is about the heart. This is about your relationship with God. This is about what's really true inside your heart. And so we came to the conclusion as we've been reading through the book of Galatians that there is no way, shape, or form that any of us could ever be good enough, that we could ever obey enough of the law to make us righteous. Therefore, you either walk away from God and you say, I can't do this, it's unfair, or you start to realize that that's the reason why Jesus came into the world, is to save us sinners, to come and pay the price for our sins, to take upon himself the righteous indignation, the wrath of God, the penalty for our sins upon himself so that you and I can be free and be inheritors in the kingdom of heaven, co-inheritors, inheritors with Jesus Christ. Now, these are things that we can't fathom very well because in our society and being human beings, we, we can't really uh, understand the depths of that, but we understand enough to be able to hold on to it through faith. And that's why everything we talk about has to do with faith. Faith is what really allows you to receive that salvation. Faith is what allows you to, to, uh, to be reached by Christ because he's the one that's reaching out to us and it's by faith we say yes. By faith we say, I surrender. By faith I, I say, okay, I will walk with you. And I will uh, give up my burdens and take upon myself your yoke, which is easy and your burden is light. So this is the place that we come to. But then on a practical level, on a day-to-day -day level as a Christian, you can see the whole gamut. You can see the whole 21st century church and everyone scurrying around trying to do, do it right. You know, Everyone's trying to do it right. And that's why I give people the benefit of the doubt, even if they're into strange and unusual doctrines, if they're too legalistic, if they're too liberal, if they're too this or too that, it doesn't matter to me. What my job is as a child of God, and your job is as a child of God, is to bring everyone closer to Christ. So if someone doesn't know Christ, you bring them to Christ. You, you introduce them to Christ. If they are young Christians, you help them to mature. If they're mature Christians, you still edify them and bring them closer to Christ. And that's what we do. We bring everyone closer to Christ. And in order for us to be able to be in this state whereby we're usable by God, we have to be free of the bondage and the influence of our flesh and our flesh, which is constantly being prodded upon and, and influenced by, by the devil and his minions. But most of the things that we go through in this life have nothing to do with the devil. The devil kind of put it in, in place and kind of kicked, kicked Adam and Eve down the hill and they're still rolling. It's, it's like you don't even have to uh, be tempted by the devil in order to, to fail and fall every single day. You just have to give in to your flesh. The only thing that Satan could tempt us uh, with was uh, were the desires of our flesh. If we didn't have this flesh, then we couldn't be tempted. If we didn't have this this flesh, we could, uh, we wouldn't find ourselves in the mess that we're in. But because we have this flesh, and this flesh is in a fallen state, we have this dual nature. This is what we've been looking at. We have this dual nature. The, the dual nature is that even though you were born a Christian and the Spirit of God has come into you, you still have this flesh, which is fallen flesh. It's not like uh, Adam and Eve. It is a flesh that has now gone through centuries and centuries and thousands of years of, of uh of curses and DNA to make us what we are today. And now in this century, we are probably more, our flesh is even more tainted than ever before by the things of the world because our flesh responds to this world. Our flesh is resonates with the things of the, the, the world and the things around us. And as things have become darker and, and more immoral, our flesh is enticed by even more things that they were never enticed with before. Even coming up in the 60s, I, was, I thought we were a wild bunch. People that were hippies and took drugs and danced around on mountaintops and took drugs and all the things. I thought we were really immoral, but the generations that followed us were even more immoral than we were.
but were just, it became much more acceptable to be immoral. It became acceptable to be bisexual. It became acceptable to be homosexual. It became acceptable to, to have these, these, uh, and for these strange and fervent desires for things that are, that are just ungodly. And so that's what we're, where we're living now. And we are Christians living in Sodom and Gomorrah. We are really living in Sodom and Gomorrah. Not that everyone in the world is, is uh, totally just dark, but the world itself is now in complete control of the prince of the power of the air, the God of this world, and we are in the midst of it. And so, with that in mind, how can we walk unscathed and untainted by the things of the world? When Jesus prayed in, in uh, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, I, I pray that you would not take these out of the world, but that you would sanctify them from the world by your word. And what he was talking about was that he wants us to be in the midst of the world, he wants us to be interacting with the people inside this world, but he wants us to be set apart from this world in our hearts. So how does that happen? And that's what we were looking at last week. He said, if you walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Sometimes we think our flesh is not so bad. You know, my, I look at somebody else that is, is really carnal. I, I can say in my flesh that I'm pretty good compared to that person there. I, I don't get drunk. I don't love it. I don't uh, chase women, I don't do all these other things, but my flesh is still just as wicked as that person's flesh. So what sets me apart and what sets you apart is when we walk in the Spirit. If we're not walking in the Spirit, we blend in very well with the world. That's why so much of the church today looks like the world, they behave like the world, they cuss like the world, they lie like the world, they fornicate like the world, they do everything that the world does, but yet they're believers. And I believe that many of them are true believers, but they have been deceived greatly by, by believing that if I just worship God, if I just go to church, if I just read my Bible, then everything is fine. And that's not true. We have to walk in the Spirit. The Bible teaches us how to walk in the Spirit. The Spirit himself gives us the, the ability and enables us to walk in the Spirit. But we have to choose on a daily basis who we're going to serve. We can, we can say, yes, I believe in Jesus, I love you, Jesus, I worship you, God, and then go out and be carnal all day. And we sometimes we are. But we have a choice whether or not we're going to be carnal. We have a choice whether or not we're going to choose to walk in the Spirit or not walk in the Spirit. So he says, the reason why he's even saying walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, he's assuming that you have the, the choice to, to do one or the other. But he, he does make it really clear that the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. And, and he's, he's saying this and leaning it in a direction that yes, you, are, you find yourself being carnal, you find yourself doing the things in the flesh, you find yourself doing things that you do not wish, but you are still, that's because there's, there's this war going on between the flesh and the spirit. They're contrary to one another. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. If you're led by the flesh, you find yourself under the law and under the, and, and under the condemnation of the law when you're walking according to your flesh. You can even feel the pressure of it and the guilt of it. So this is what we've been looking at. And we were talking about how even Paul, um, in his letter to the Romans in Romans 7, 18, he wrote, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing <coughs> good dwells. For to will is present in me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. But the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me, I find that a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Then he goes, he just kind of caps it by saying, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So Paul, being an apostle, being someone wholly giving over to Jesus Christ on a daily basis, still found, found himself wanting. 
as far as the flesh is concerned, as far as when he is in his flesh and seeing what he does in his flesh, and then when he's walking in the spirit, he looks back and he goes, how can I do that? I hate that sin. I hate to hate. I hate to be angry. I hate to have unrighteous anger or lust or uh, to be prideful. All the things that we think about when we, as we become more like Christ. So what God is always trying to get us to do is to walk in the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit means that we, we're walking upon the water of the world and the storm is uh, blowing and the, the waves are rising and there's all this stuff around us, but he doesn't want us to look at any of that, even though we can kind of see it in our peripheral vision. He wants us to keep our eyes upon him. Because as we look upon him, the lamp of the body is the eye, and if the eye be single, your whole body shall be full of light. You will be able to see, you will be able to be clear, you will be able to walk in strength if you don't dwell upon the carnality that you see around you, even in your own body. And so this is what he was talking about last week. Now this week, he gives us a list of, I think, 17 different works of the flesh, and that's why I was saying that in the start. A common question that's asked, and that is, if we are saved by grace and faith and not of ourselves, if salvation is the gift of God and therefore can't be earned, then how do we know that we truly believe? And if we believe, what is the evidence that we truly believe? I think that this is something that everyone should be asked in order to make their calling and election sure, even after they come forward to the crusade, or they say the sinner's prayer, or they even get plugged into a church, we have to basically come to a place where we evaluate where we are by the things that we do and evaluate the, the fruit of others, not judge other souls, but evaluate the fruit of others to see how they are, to see in order that we might be able to help them, not condemn them or, or criticize them for the way that they are, but to make sure that the people that are around us that call themselves Christians are truly born again. Because if they're not born again, they will not change. They, they will be habitually in carnality. In James 2, verses 19 and 20, it said, James said, You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Not that works ever cause you to be saved or earn you any type of brownie points with God, but good works come out of a true relationship with Jesus Christ. They come out of a relationship where you're walking in the Spirit. In Matthew 3, John the Baptist, seeing the religious scribes and Pharisees, told them to repent. And he said, he added this, bear fruits worthy of repentance. He didn't say just accept or, or repent. Say that you repent. Say you're sorry. He said, bear fruits worthy of repentance. He was saying, let's see your fruit. If you have repented, you will have the fruit of repentance. You'll have the fruit to show it. And these were religious uh, rulers of the Jews. John said to them, and, and do not say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. That's what makes us righteous. We are of Jewish descent. We are of the promise of Abraham. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Jesus said something like this in Matthew 7, verse 17 through 27. He said, every good tree uh, bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear good, bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruit, you will know them. And that's why it truly is wrong to judge and condemn, but it is truly wise to evaluate people by their fruit. And the reason why we do this is so that we know how we can serve people. So if someone is a, even a person in the leadership of a church, and they are bearing rotten fruit, if I love that person, if I am willing to, to have that person not like me or cast me out of the church, or any of the, the above, it would be the most loving thing for me to take that person aside and say, pastor or elder or deacon or whoever you are, you know, I noticed this fruit. And I want you just to see what I'm seeing. And I'm going to leave it with you and I'm going to walk away and you can do anything you want. I'm going to tell you 
what I see, and then you leave it with them. And if that person is truly a godly person, and they're just in sin, hopefully they'll repent. If they don't, God will deal with them. Jesus went on to say in Matthew chapter 12, verse 33, either make the tree good, and it's fruit good, or else make the tree bad, and it's fruit bad, for a tree is no by its fruit. In other words, get, get onto the boat, or get under the dock, and don't sprout. Don't get in the middle and, and try to do both. Don't, don't be a, a, a spring of water spewing up bitter water and good water, because you have to make it one or the other. So with this in mind, uh, back in Galatians 5, verse 19, where uh, Paul describes the works or the fruit of the flesh. He said, now the works of the flesh are evident. These are things that I'm sure that he thought about countless times. Because I was looking down his list and I was saying to Sam, look at this list that he came up with. Look at this list that Paul came up with. And he, he just probably rolled off his tongue as he was writing this letter to the churches in Galatia. He said that the works of the flesh are evident. The works of the carnal mind manifesting itself through action are evident. This is the way the works of the flesh are recognized or known by these things, which are the works and actions of adultery, fornication, uncleanness, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I told you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice, that's the key word, those who habitually practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he's not, I don't think he's saying that these things are always evident. That that's all the people do. But he's saying that if you see these things in yourself, if you see these works in other people, and they are continuous, and there's no conviction, and it's the way that they live, these people or you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's very clear. Adultery, we know what that means. Having relations with another spouse, could, uh, but like Jesus said, it could be someone who just sits around and has constant lust, or you know has adultery within their mind, fornication, uh, porneo, where we get the word porno, uh, sex outside of marriage, homosexuality, um, le lesbianism, you know, bestiality. I mean, all the different things. If, I mean, the, the things that it, it states are almost embarrassing to, to read when you're looking through the definitions. Intercourse with close relatives, uh, divorced man or woman, on and on and on. Th the third is uncleanness. You would think that these other things would kind of fall into that category. Uncleanness is having lustful, sensual, perverted actions and thoughts. Licentiousness or lasciviousness, being loose, lewd, having unbridled lust, living in excess, being outrageous, shameless, all of these with an attitude of, I will not turn, a, a type of arrogance. Idolatry, the worship of false gods, the worship of money, putting anything and everything before God. Sorcery, and this is one that back in the, in, in the 60s and early 70s, this word came up a lot because so many of us were coming out of mind-bending, mind-altering drugs. Uh, but the the word sorcery here is pharmakia, the practice of witchcraft, the use or the administrating, administering of drugs and poisons, the practice of magical arts. Hatred, which is having animosity, being hostile, including loathing, bitterness, malice, and, uh, you know, spite. I like that word, spite. It sounds like bite. <laughs> but... <clears throat> Think about that, loathing, loathing someone, bitterness towards someone, malicious feelings towards someone, and spite, all things that I've experienced as a born again Christian. And that's what I've always tried to do now, every time I'm tempted to hate someone is to give it up. I had a choice all those years to give it up and I chose not to because I wasn't at that growth stage where I was able to really want to go because I thought of all the reasons why I should be able to hate them. And he did, he did hurt me, and he was a liar, he was a, a cheat and a sneak, but that didn't matter. What mattered was that I was not, as a child of the Most High God, to have this work of, of the flesh. 
I was not to live in it. I was not to dwell in it. I wasn't to bathe in it. And I found out, I found myself through years, while I was bitter, I, I spewed out my bitterness. You know, one time I was talking to me, he says, you know, that's spilling out all over you. Because you have to, you have to nip that. You have to nip that. It's just coming out all over you. It's like, oh, I know, I know. I'm trying, you know. There's just, you know, God gave you two ears and one mouth. What does that tell you? It's hard to just shut your mouth. Don't say anything. Even if it's still in there, just be quiet. And I, and I took that. Contentions, creating and spreading strife. That follows along with my testimony. Creating and spreading strife, constantly in debate, jealousies, an envious and contentious rivalry, a fervent indignation toward others because of a desire to what? To have what they have, to be where they are. And that can always be a, a thing. It could be like that if you're a musician, where somebody else has the stage, or somebody else has a record out of you on the record, or someone else is doing really well, and somehow or other you're not doing well. If someone has a really huge church and you have a little church. You know, it's like um, going to the pastor's conferences for years. Um, I used to go for a long time when I didn't have a church, so it was really easy for me. You know, I, I would just go and I was I just worked for Chuck. So I'd be with Chuck and there were all these pastors there and I'd hear the conversation. So how many people do you have in your congregation now? So how many services do you have? And on and on and on. And I know a lot of the pastors that had smaller churches had a hard time with the megachurch pastors because they were so defined by the number of people that they had. And the, the smaller church pastors felt inferior to the uh, the megachurch pastors because they were really blessed because they had all these people. And then I think about the Mormon church and they even have more people. And Scientology has even more, you know, it's like, then you start to get the picture that it doesn't matter how many people they have. And that is how you are serving God and what you're doing. Because I've met some of the most godly people in the, some of the smallest churches. Pastors some of the smallest churches. Some of the most unknown musicians and artists are some of the most humble and godly people that I've ever met. Whereas some people that are really big are some of the most arrogant and egotistic people that I've ever met. And the same thing happens in the churches. Jealousy, envious and contentious rivalry. Outbursts of wrath, which comes from the uh, Greek word thumos, where we get the word uh, thermos, keeping it hot. Think about thermoses. You know, it's like nowadays it's like hard to find a uh, container that keeps the heat of your coffee. Sam's always looking for that perfect thermos, but it means keeping it hot. The idea here is an anger which boils up, subsides, and then boils up again. It's an unquenchable, hateful anger that just keeps cooking. Simmering. It may not be in a loud burst, but it's always there. And sooner or later, it comes out. It just explodes. Selfish ambition. This word is found before New Testament times only in Aristotle, where it describes a self-seeking pursuit of political office by unfair means. Therefore, it is someone who strives with a desire to put oneself forward with no consideration of those whom they may have to step on to get there. It's that, that old chant, push and chub, push and chub, get there first, you know. Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4 says, let nothing be done, nothing, anything that you do, be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. That to me is just a statement of love. That's what love does. It esteems the other person. It prefers the other person. Even if you, somewhere in your mind, have that truth that you might be better at that person than what you're doing, it is the godly thing to do to step under them, to prefer them, and let them have the preeminence before you, you will let them have before you, you show your stuff. It's that whole concept of going and coming into a room and sitting on the floor and waiting for the master of the, the house to call you up to that seat of honor rather than looking at that seat of honor when you walk in and going, that's my seat. I deserve that seat. I've worked really hard for that seat. I've put in this many years for that seat. 
I have read this much, I have this much information, I have my doctor, you know, it's like all this stuff that people do. I have two doctors and three masters and blah, 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 and, and just go, but how about your heart? How do you treat people? How do you treat a waitress or a waiter when they come to your table? That tells you a lot about who you are. It's how you treat other people that may come to serve you. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. James 3, 14 through 16 says, But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion, and every evil thing will be there. So going back to our list. Number 12, dissensions causing division among people, gossiping, slander. Uh, I think gossip is, is pretty close to murder. You might murder someone physically, and that's a, that's a horrible wrong, but you can murder someone with your mouth and their reputation and have them scorn and shame for the rest of their lives, even if it's not true. All you have to do is be a good salesperson. Convince other people that someone has done something or is something or uh, has a certain character flaw, and people will believe that or not. Anyone can say anything about any of you and ruin your reputation. The good thing is, is that if we don't try to defend ourselves, but we let God defend us, then he will take care of all of our enemies. Heresies literally mean an act of uh, talk, taking, capture, storming in the city. In the Bible, it's those who cause division within the church, teaching false doctrine, leading people astray with things that aren't true. 14, envy like jealousy, to, to desire, crave, want, wish, hunger with resentment toward those who have what you desire. Murders, to premeditate killing someone and performing them. Drunkenness, to be under the control of any substance which intoxicates. So some people look at this and they go, well, I, I don't drink, I smoke pot. <laughs> I don't drink, I, 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 you know, I, I do that. It's all the same. Drunkenness has to do with anything that changes the natural order of the way that you think, uh, except for things that you absolutely have to have. Uh, revelries, carousing, the description of a nocturnal, it doesn't have to be nocturnal, but I think that that's the image that we get. Think Mardi Gras. Yeah. Carousing, the description of, of a nocturnal and riotous procession of drunken and rollicking people who after supper parade through the streets with tortures and music in honor of whatever. Throwing, you know, beads and whatever. Mm -hmm. Deity and sing and play before houses of, of male and female parents. Therefore used generally of feasts and drunken parties that are prolonged till late at night or for that matter could go all night. Paul said all of these works are evidence of the flesh. And in the second part of verse 21 he says of, of which I tell you beforehand just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So these are strong words. How do you get around them? You can. And that's where I'm going to end tonight. I don't believe, as I look around this room, because I know most of you, that any of you fit into these categories. But we do know people that do. We do know that people that have, that are not only influenced by these things, but they are embedded in them. And some of these people are professing Christians. And oftentimes we don't want to say anything to them because we don't want to offend anybody else. This whole idea of live and let live in the society, even within the house of God, has caused the house of God to become polluted and diluted because we're so afraid of being called legalistic or, or uh, old wineskins or old fashioned or old school. But I'll tell you, Jesus was old school. 2,000 year old school and even before that because he has appeared way before the birth of, of that uh, Jesus who was born in the nature. He has always been, he always will be and we now have him living within us by the way of the Holy Spirit and we have something to do. And if we don't do it, you'll, you'll not only be bored, you'll feel empty even as a Christian. No matter how often you go to church, no matter how you read your Bible, you worship God, and unless you are doing the work of God, unless you are out giving away what God gives to you, what you have will, will come. You'll always feel empty. You'll feel lost. You'll feel like a floundering fish out of a fish out of water. Because we were made for this. 
We were made to be God's witnesses. We were empowered to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. That's why he gave us the power. It, he didn't have to give us the power. He could have given us just salvation. And that'd be enough. To say, okay, you believe in me, you're saved. But he also empowered us by way of the Holy Spirit. And it was important for Jesus to let his disciples know this. To, to let them know that I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Parakletos, the Comforter. And when he comes, he will give. He will come and do you with power to be my witnesses, martyrs, to be my martyrs. Power, that where we get our word uh, dunamis or dynamite. And we have that, but it's dormant. It's it might even be kinetic, but it's not something that we're, we're unleashing on the society. Otherwise, you would see a lot happening in our society and in, in our communities. There, it's just not happening anymore. People are, are satisfied going to churches and just doing yoga or, or going to churches and joining the golf club, going to churches and joining the paddle, paddle board club. So you can do that with other Christians. That's well and fine. I think God loves it when we fellowship. But what God really wants us to do is find some way of being a light on a hill. Find some way of, of uh, letting your light so shine before men so that they might see your good work and glorify your Father 